you want to yeah. start. Yeah. All right. Um, welcome, everybody. This is uh, a great um, a pleasure to be able to welcome uh, Dr. Satu Valdeva uh, for our seminar series. Um, she's a senior research, <coughs> research fellow at Conflict Analysis Research Center at the University of Kent. Her main area of research interest is politics in the post-Soviet space, with a particular focus on grassroots activism and international development in Central Asia. Currently, she is uh, researching Chinese, Russian, and Western investment strategies in Central Asia and their varied implications for the region. Um, Elmira, the floor is all yours. Uh, like I said, we'll have uh, the speaker speak for about 50 minutes, and then we'll open it up to questions and answers. Thank you. So is the PowerPoint up now? Yes. OK, excellent. Well, um, greetings to everybody. Um, I would like to start by thanking uh, the Cambridge Central Asia Forum for inviting me to do this talk. Um, I'm very happy to be here uh, with all of you. And um, uh, let me just uh, jump straight in. So um, this talk is uh, part of the um, larger project that um, uh, myself and Dr. Valihar Sangere are working on. And uh, uh, we're assessing uh, the um, impact and effects of uh, neoliberalization uh, of the past 30 years. Okay, so um, the argument uh, that uh, I'll be making today is that um, social movements in uh, Kazakhstan and Kyrgyzstan emerged in response to the harms caused by neoliberalism. And uh, in, within our framework, neoliberalism uh, refers to the um, commodification of uh, uh, land, housing, money, and natural resources. So elsewhere, uh, we're actually discussing uh, three uh, social movements. Uh, and today here, I'll be presenting uh, the first two, which is land and housing movement and the anti-debt movements in uh, Kazakhstan and Kyrgyzstan. Um, let me uh, talk a little bit about our um, theoretical framework. Um, we are using uh, Polanyan analysis because we find it actually quite uh, uh, fruitful and useful. And um, uh, Polanyi uh, argued that uh, once uh, market forces um, transform uh, resources like land, uh, labor, and money into commodities, uh, uh, then um, it leads to a lot of um, uh, social disasters and a lot of suffering. And uh, society, uh, after being exposed to the um, winds of the unfettered market, um, uh, mobilizes to defend itself. And uh, so commodification processes trigger um, the so-called protective uh, counter movements. And these counter movements, they vary in their um, aspiration and they in their goals. Um, so uh, some of them uh, wish uh, for the market forces uh, to limit the impact of the market forces. Others actually want to reverse the commodification processes. So um, recently, a lot of uh, uh, Polanyan scholars are basically extending the uh, Polanyan framework and referring to all these counter movements as uh, um, movements engaged in decommodification processes. Another quite valuable uh, aspect of the uh, Polanyan framework is his dictum that laser fair was planned. And uh, this urges us actually to pay attention to the kind of class alliances that emerge in uh, uh, various um, contexts. Um, and uh, Polanyi actually you know, diverts our attention to um, the, the um, link uh, or the dependency of the uh, uh, domestic uh, um, either state elites and economic elites uh, uh, with uh, international um, powers. At the same time, uh, Polanyi famously said that um, self-regulating markets um, um, is a myth. Um, there is no such thing and that uh, state plays a crucial role in uh, managing markets. Uh, it can actually be co-opted by uh, laissez-faire forces. 
Um, and uh, we need to assess the role of the state in all of this. Um, at the same time, state uh, functions as a site of contestation. So a lot of the uh, rules and regulations that are in place will reflect the kind of social struggle that uh, takes place uh, in uh, uh, various uh, countries. So the interaction between the state and counter movements are essential and uh, the state can either embrace uh, these counter movements, weaken them or crush them. So uh, briefly on the empirical basis uh, for this talk, um, we have um, conducted uh, uh, some structured interviews with uh, uh, property developers. Um, now these were uh, uh, from Bishkek. Um, 75 interviews with uh, residents of informal settlements uh, in uh, four sites, Nur Sultan, Bishkek, Almaty, and Osh. And these interviews uh, were done in 2011. And then we conducted 29 uh, semi structured interviews uh, with um, uh, the well representatives of the financial sector and uh, 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 governmental officials, officials that are sort of you know responsible and linked to to uh, regulation of the uh, financial sector. And uh, then also um, we conducted a focus group with uh, the national and uh, regional leaders of the anti-debt movement in Kyrgyzstan uh, in 2016. So um, let me begin with the first uh, social movement, which is the land and housing uh, movement, which was largely mobilized by the rural migrants and the propertyless groups in both countries. And this, uh, particular social movement is uh, rooted in uh, commodification of land and housing. Um, the institution of private property rights uh, had varying effects in rural areas and in uh, urban areas. In uh, rural areas, um, privatization of the farming land uh, led, led to mass unemployment. Uh, uh, farmers couldn't survive on individualized uh, farming. And that led to uh, mass exodus uh, to large internal and external migration. So um, hence, that's how uh, a lot of rural migrants ended up in um, urban uh, uh, centers. Uh, now, once they arrived to uh, these urban areas, they were faced with a situation where the urban space is uh, commodified. Um, much of the land is appropriated by uh, elites. And at the same time, uh, they can't afford housing. So um, there is a financialization of housing. The state stopped providing uh, free housing, and it shifted the burden of the um, supply of housing to private actors. And this private actors, uh, if there is one thing that emerged in our interviews with the um, property developers, is that they were not interested in uh, building social housing. And uh, they viewed housing actually as a form of investment. And um, uh, they um, sort of emphasized that um, uh, social housing is just not profitable and they were after you know fairly significant uh, profit margins um, and uh, most of these uh, um, private construction companies ended up uh, building elite housing which was utterly unaffordable so that kind of um, structural context um, leads to a situation where rural migrants are forced to um, claim land on the outskirts. And uh, you have uh, some, in early 2000s, the emergence of um, uh, informal settlements in uh, Nur Sultan, Almaty, Bishkek, and Osh. And uh, you, can, uh, you can see the size of the settlements, and they're fairly large. Uh, so the largest one is actually in Almaty. Um, the population is uh, um, uh, around 700,000. But in all uh, um, areas, you can actually see that uh, informal residents constitute roughly 20 to 30 percent of the city population. So that's a very significant number. Um, these uh, settlements um, emerged on uh, um, areas that were not uh, good for cultivation. So these were a sort of swamplands, uh, wastelands, 
um, uh, and uh, you know, or, or areas around bazaars uh, like um, Dordoy and Barahulka, very sort of undesirable areas. Um, and uh, informal residents actually transformed this land and made them habitable. And uh, for some time uh, until uh, 2005, uh, you know, the, the, the state and uh, um, the domestic uh, elites, they left them alone. And, and uh, this sort of uh, existed uh, this, uh, in, in, this, in this space, uh, more or less um, ignored uh, by uh, the laser fair forces. However, things begin to change uh, by 2005. Uh, and uh, the way these informal settlements are treated uh, varies in uh, Kazakhstan and Kyrgyzstan. In Kazakhstan, by 2005, uh, you have um, oil boom and uh, a very rapid uh, expansion of the financial sector. Now, all of that leads to the construction boom. So uh, the bank loans, uh, you know, 70% of them were all linked uh, to the real estate sector. So there is a fueling of uh, uh, construction. Uh, construction. Uh, at the same time, uh, you know, all this. Um, capital inflows, uh, sort of avoid uh, domestic political elites and uh, um, political elites in, in Kazakhstan uh, begin to develop these master plans, uh, which envision uh, Astana and Almaty as, as uh, you know, uh, as, as, as this, uh, well, different cities. So Astana is supposed to be, you know, a, a capital city, which uh, symbolizes successful capitalist modernization. Almaty, uh, you know, is envisaged as uh, an international investment hub. Uh, you know, uh, we know that um, development in Astana, you know, something like close to 40 billion uh, went into it. And uh, all of that just, you know, drives, um, uh, you know, the speculative uh, uh, investment in, in, in real estate. And uh, the effects of that is that, of course, you know, the, the um, housing prices s skyrocket. In uh, Almaty, between 2002 and 2006, the price uh, for a square meter went up 14 times from uh, $250 to $3,600. Um, in premium sites, actually, uh, one sulco of land uh, was uh, valued uh, around uh, uh, $700,000. Uh, and, uh, uh, you know, the, even though there was a sort of an, an insignific insignificant price drop uh, after the financial crisis, nevertheless, the overall sort of, you know, long trajectory for the housing prices is that, you know, they quadrupled in Almaty and tripled in Nur Sultan. So recently there was a study um, done actually by the World Bank. Uh, it came out in 2020 that showed uh, uh, that, um, housing uh, in Almaty and Nur Sultan uh, was more unaffordable than in some of the most, you know, world's exclusive cities like uh, San Francisco and Vancouver. And uh, in Kyrgyzstan, uh, you don't have this type of uh, uh, construction boom uh, simply because, uh, you know, uh, country is deemed as uh, highly risky after the two uh, political uprisings, uh, and uh, these uprise uprisings dampen the investor confidence. Um, the real estate sector um, attracts very little foreign capital. Uh, the mortgage mar market is very small and very weak. And because you don't have this kind of you know, speculative pressure, and you don't have the kind of capital inflows that Kazakhstan has, um, you know, the political elite doesn't have any ambitious master plans. Um, and uh, here you can sort of compare uh, the um, prices per square meter in uh, Bishkek with uh, Kazakhstan. And here's a pro probably important to note that uh, what uh, David Harvey um, observed is that when you uh, have this kind of um, uh, sudden capital inflow into cities, it actually redefines the very nature of the city. Uh, you know, what kind of city, you know, who, who can live in it and who can't. So uh, this uh, speculative drive, uh, you know, leads to a situation where um, 
you now have the class alliance of uh, uh, the um, uh, state elites and the uh, construction companies um, and bankers, uh, you know, uh, buying up, uh, um, you know, uh, land sites uh, within and around the city. And, uh, you know, the crucial role here was played by the mayor of Almaty, uh, who later became the mayor of Nur Sultan, um, who um, authorized uh, a private company, Almaty Jer, to um, confiscate uh, land uh, uh, within the city and uh, uh, on the outskirts under the pretext of eminent domain, um, which, uh, you know, uh, was untrue because the, the lands that um, were confiscated, they all were very swiftly auctioned and uh, uh, sold to um, property, private property developers. Uh, none of these lands were uh, used for um, state purposes. And uh, in 2006, uh, he uh, orders, um, well, he sells the land uh, on, that was under Shamrak and Bakai settlements to eight investors orders mass demolitions. All these uh, orders are without, uh, they're illegal, they're without the court order. Um, and uh, uh, this obviously um, begins uh, the, the process of mobilization. Um, but um, um, the, the, um, the, the middle classes that also were affected by uh, the eviction orders, they sort of, uh, um, have their own mobilization, uh, but the ones that were affected uh, uh, sort of more severely by this demolition notice were the, uh, all the informal settlements. So um, they initially, um, uh, a lot of informal residents in, in, in uh, residents of these informal settlements actually uh, were caught by surprise and they did not anticipate uh, this kind of, uh, uh, sort of very sudden um, attack from, 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 from the state because um, in 2006, um, uh, Kazakhstan actually passed the amnesty law, which allowed, uh, uh, well, various groups to legalize um, their illegal land plots. So, um, but obviously the amnesty law was designed for the elites that, you know, uh, built uh, mansions uh, in, in, in places like, you know, the, the Medeo National uh, Reserve Park. So actually the mayor of Almaty, Tasma Gambetta himself built like a store, four story mansion in, in that area. Um, and, uh, but, you know, technically uh, residents of these informal settlements could also uh, apply and they did apply. And, uh, you know, the, um, so, so demolitions sort of occurred in this kind of context when the state on the one hand announced that uh, uh, citizens could legalize their um, illegal land plots. And at the same time, uh, uh, there were these um, orders for mass demolitions. Um, but then very swiftly, uh, they realized that um, the state is quite serious about its plans to clear uh, these sites and they began to mobilize for self-defense. Um, to protect their houses and their land plots. Um, they begin to uh, protest, to uh, uh, search for alliances with uh, uh, leading oppositional parties. Uh, unfortunately, um, you know, um, Alga and uh, um, Azad, uh, which were the two sort of leading oppositional parties at the time, they don't show any solidarity. And uh, informal residents are left on their own, uh, but they do get support from some of the small uh, leftist and nationalist organizations like Talmas and uh, Kazakh Memlekete. Um, so between uh, February and summer of 2006, uh, you know, informal uh, residents of informal citizen, uh, settlements actually engage in uh, uh, in, in these struggles, in these battles uh, with the city administration and with the police. Uh, there were at least eight eviction operations uh, in, in that year. Uh, and they were very violent. So this is, this is, this is the important aspect of um, uh, the dispossession by the uh, uh, laser field forces is that um, all of these persons are extremely violent. Um, at some point, uh, um, 
the uh, residents actually managed to film uh, all these attacks that they're experiencing and they traveled to Astana and uh, they um, screened uh, the footage uh, to uh, various parliamentarians and uh, there was um, a decision made to sort of, you know, uh, to announce a moratorium on these uh, evictions and to set up a committee to investigate uh, the matter. Um, however, Tasmagandetov, just after one week of the uh, screening of that uh, film, uh, you know, ordered urgent uh, demolitions. And in July of uh, 26, um, uh, 2006, uh, something like 500 uh, houses were demolished in one single day. Um, a week later, they arrive, uh, you know, heavily armed forces arrive to Shaman Iraq to do the same thing. And uh, uh, this, this is when the conflict actually sort of, you know, um, uh, intensifies. And, uh, um, and, and uh, the residents actually, you know, were prepared to, to uh, 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 you know, fight and, you know, uh, fight off the, uh, the police and uh, uh, it ends in, 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 in a tragedy when uh, uh, at some point uh, in informal uh, residents uh, uh, capture four policemen and take them into hostage. Uh, and then at some point when uh, negotiations break down, they satellite one of the policemen and he uh, later dies uh, in the hospital. So uh, the Shangrak uh, events actually ended with uh, uh, 108 arrests uh, and uh, then four key activists were jailed and uh, one of them is still today in prison. But the important uh, point about the Shangrak events is that they actually uh, deterred uh, demolitions uh, in, in uh, other uh, settlements, uh, including uh, in Astana. So this kind of combative resistance, uh, you know, although it, uh, you know, uh, resulted in casualties, it, it, it did have its impact and it stopped uh, further demolition plans. The state uh, actually, um, after the Shangrak events, uh, promised to legalize uh, informal settlements and to, uh, as, as one of the um, uh, workers of the uh, Almaty city administration said, uh, we, we promised to st stop chasing people with bulldozers. Um, but unfortunately in uh, 2009, uh, they uh, resumed demolitions and uh, Re renewed demolitions actually then lead to mobilization of uh, 18 mini districts in uh, that area, which is now called the Alatau district. And uh, people set up uh, this movement, uh, uh, sort of formally titled as People's Committee for the Protection of Constitutional Rights to Land and Housing. And uh, in, in this uh, time frame, the struggles for the legalization of land plots are um, impeded uh, by criminalization of uh, unsanctioned protests and uh, uh, sort of public peaceful gatherings. Um, and uh, the uh, sort of there were very little opportunities for um, political alliances because uh, uh, by uh, 2010 and uh, 2011, um, most opposition is uh, wiped out. They're either in exile or jailed, or uh, some of them are dead. So um, again, the uh, informal residents were more or less on their own, um, and they had to sort of deal with the state um, on their own. And uh, in, in this kind of political um, restrictive uh, context, uh, in 2011, the state offers uh, rent contracts uh, instead of legalization. Rent con contracts allowed, uh, allowed them to stay there for uh, 10 years. Uh, and, and actually, you know, these rent contracts expire this year. Um, uh, so the, the, this offer that was made uh, by the state ends up splitting the movement because uh, um, some informal residents, uh, such as those who are living in Bakai, they accept them um, under the pressure of uh, um, 
security officers actually. And uh, Kurulashi residents, they refused to sign them. And uh, they, in 2011, take uh, the city administration to court. Uh, uh, they start the long litigation process uh, that takes years. Uh, and uh, um, nevertheless, um, the um, Kurulashi residents under the uh, leadership of uh, uh, Zaurian, it's, it's, it's quite, you know, um, charismatic uh, former civil servant, um, they managed to legalize uh, 3,600 homes. However, when we spoke uh, to the um, Almaty uh, city administration, they more or less said that, look, all these people in this, they're actually referred to these informal settlements as African slums. Uh, they said uh, nobody wants to see these African slums here, and uh, uh, in our plans, uh, you know, despite the some of the legalization of land plot and houses, uh, they are going to be uh, sort of uh, evicted anyway, sooner or later. And uh, he more or less confirmed that uh, uh, the residents of all these informal settlements were on borrowed time, and that uh, sooner or later um, they would be uh, evicted. Um, if uh, we compare um, the counter movements, um, well, the way uh, informal residents were treated in Kyrgyzstan, uh, well, you get a uh, you know, somewhat different story. Um, and it's because you don't have that kind of uh, uh, pressure uh, from the uh, uh, laissez faire forces. And uh, in 2005, uh, well, in Kyrgyzstan, you actually have, you know, the Tulip Revolution that offers the opportunity for um, informal residents in Kyrgyzstan to um, legalize their lands. And uh, this was very much, um, you know, the, the legitimacy was uh, afforded by the Tulip uh, Revolution because the kind of deal that, uh, you know, oppositional elites and rural migrants struck at the time was that, you know, if they support the uprising, then, uh, then the state would, uh, you know, legalize um, and their land plots. And uh, after March uh, uh, Revolution, um, various um, rural uh, migrants organize, um, you know, um, localized uh, groups, uh, and they quickly, uh, you know, uh, join and uh, set up the so-called Coordination Council. And uh, they exert a very strong pressure uh, on uh, uh, the city administration to um, legalize their land plots uh, immediately. And uh, actually, um, they, they, you know, almost, uh, you know, were camping out outside uh, the um, city administration. And by October of 2005, uh, most of the uh, uh, land plots were legalized. So the demands of the uh, movement uh, uh, in, in Bishkek, they moved swiftly from legalization to infrastructure improvement. So at the heart of uh, um, social movement in Kyrgyzstan uh, was the infrastructure improvement rather than legalization. So if, if um, informal residents in uh, uh, Kazakhstan uh, were fighting simply for, uh, you know, for the mere right to exist. Uh, in Kyrgyzstan, it's 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 the right to sort of live with dignity. Um, there were exceptions. Uh, the, there were two uh, um, sites, fairly large, uh, sort of um, mm, uh, settlements that Kelechek uh, and Nagjar that uh, were privatized by uh, uh, rich elites in the 90s, and they. Uh, you know, ended up uh, fighting them uh, in courts for a good five to six years. Um, but nevertheless, uh, again, uh, rural migrants in Bishkek actually managed to um, uh, force the prosecutor's office to take uh, these rich elites to court and uh, to um, force uh, uh, the uh, Supreme Court to, uh, you know, uh, make the decision in their favor. Um, and uh, much of the protests in Kyrgyzstan uh, were not uh, about evictions, they were about uh, infrastructure improvement and the, the, the peak of activism uh, 
took place after the second uh, uh, political uprising, um, uh, around the time when um, Almazbek Atambayev was also running for election. And you can see that between 2010 and 2013, there were uh, over 2,000 protests. Uh, the the uh, people that participated in these protests, sort of, there, you know, these were large crowds. Um, um, hundreds of thousands uh, uh, were uh, protesting and demanding uh, improvement uh, uh, to their living conditions. And, um, and uh, all this activism leads in 2011 uh, to uh, the state embracing the uh, social movements in Bishkek and formally integrating uh, informal settlements into the um, Bishkek City Council. Um, which was sort of a, a positive development, but at the same time, there was a downside to this because uh, once, once these uh, uh, social movements were uh, sort of integrated, um, the state uh, pressurized them to, uh, you know, um, uh, to, to develop their own um, five-year development plans. And they were sort of, uh, transforming them into self-help groups uh, and urging them to um, you know raise funds uh, engage with donors uh, and uh, you know uh, stop uh, sort of you know uh, protesting and uh, blocking the roads and basically essentially depoliticize them now the the um, demands for uh, infrastructure improvement uh, got renewed it was uh, the third uh, political uprising and uh, uh, the residents of uh, uh, now these new settlements uh, um, have overwhelmingly voted for Sadr Japarov and uh, he sort of uh, you know expected to um, provide the goods uh, to uh, uh, these areas. If we would compare the um, state counter movement interactions in Kazakhstan and Kyrgyzstan, uh, we can see that uh, Kazakhstani state largely pursued repressive and exclusionary policies. And the forceful evictions uh, under the uh, eminent domain are still ongoing today. Uh, and, uh, um, and, and, and they're probably going to intensify now that the rent contracts in uh, uh, Shangrak are going to expire. Um, in Kyrgyzstan, the state actually never engaged in uh, mass demolitions and evictions. Uh, it uh, swiftly legalized informal settlements and uh, they are now formally part of the city. Uh, in two cases, the state actually acted against some of the Rontia elites, which is very rare, um, but nevertheless that happened. But the important uh, 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 sort of um, thing here is that in both countries, in Kazakhstan and Kyrgyzstan, the sanctity of the private property rights uh, were unchallenged. So, you know, the movements did gain some concessions in Kyrgyzstan, but, you know, uh, the, the neoliberal commodification uh, is not challenged. So, um, now I will uh, move on to the uh, second case study and talk about the anti-debt social movements that emerged in uh, Kazakhstan and Kyrgyzstan. And they are rooted in the expansion of credit uh, or what uh, Polanyi calls commodification of money. Um, again, due to oil boom, uh, the financial sector in Kazakhstan expanded rapidly uh, between uh, 2000 and 2007. Uh, Kazakhstani banks borrowed uh, extensively uh, from uh, Western banks, largely Western banks, um, uh, 46 billion, uh, which uh, inflated the, you know, increased uh, Kazakhstan's uh, external debt, debt from uh, 18 billion in 2003 to 108 billion, which I think was something like 93% of the GDP. Um, the interesting thing is that all this uh, borrowing was viewed as a positive development and uh, there were no warnings about the debt trap and uh, uh, you know that exposing uh, the 
financial sector to uh, such risks is dangerous. Uh, so, you know, EBRD's assessment of the financial sector was uh, very positive. Actually, you know, uh, financial sector was uh, uh, deemed as the um, jewel crown of the uh, Kazakhstan's economy. Um, so, you know, th this type of borrowing was uh, uh, praised and um, uh, this led to uh, um, sort of in, in, in indebting of the of the of the um, population between uh, within three years. You can see um, between two thousand seven and uh, two thousand four and two thousand seven, uh, two hundred thousand mortgages were issued. Um, they were mostly dollar denominated, and uh, issued at fairly high interest rates. And the result is that today, most of the, well, 80% of the um, economically active uh, Kazakhstani citizens are in debt. In Kyrgyzstan, uh, indebtedness is linked to the uh, microcredit uh, micro uh, and uh, not, not so much to the, um, uh, the growth of the, of the banking sector. And, um, Microfinance grew uh, with the help of uh, the um, international financial institutions, um, such as the World Bank and the um, US Agency of International Development. Um, in particular, these four um, microcredit institutions were set up um, by them. And uh, these four actually, um, they dominate the market and uh, uh, service 77% um, of uh, borrowers. Um, this microcredit lending was uh, framed uh, as uh, poverty reduction and uh, women's empowerment uh, at later stages as uh, financial inclusion. Again, all in uh, uh, wonderful uh, sort of you know, positive terms, uh, despite the fact that the uh, loans were short term and uh, issued at uh, really high interest rates. So um, at the time, uh, the interest rates ranged between 44% and 180%. Uh, um, by 2015, uh, most of the borrowers were um, rural women. Uh, the extent of indebtedness is unknown, but we know, you know from the credit bureau that uh, um, more than half a million people uh, have taken out microcredit loans. Uh, but uh, you know, chances are that you know, uh, pretty much every single family in Kyrgyzstan is affected by this. And uh, how? Or, you know, the, the, again, emphasizing the role of the state, how was it possible that, uh, uh, you know, such, such usurious um, loans um, were um, widespread uh, in Kazakhstan and uh, Kyrgyzstan? Well, it's because uh, the, uh, the laws, uh, of, you know, that regulate the financial sector, they permit uh, banks and MFIs to determine their own uh, size of uh, loans, interest rates, and uh, penalty and commission rates. Um, uh, the laws also allowed uh, banks and MFIs to um, seize the collateral uh, without the court order. And uh, here we actually borrowed the, um, um, the term, the debt fair state from Suzanne Soderberg who argued that uh, the states that um, um, legitimize, uh, you know, and uh, um, in introduce this kind of uh, uh, regulatory mechanisms should be defined as debt fair states um, because they um, normalize and reproduce, uh, you know, debt led forms of uh, capital accumulation. So um, the crown jewel of the uh, Kazakhstani economy goes bust uh, in 2008 um, because of the financial uh, crisis. And uh, um, that leads to uh, um, 
devaluation of the tenge and uh, uh, a lot of the mortgage loans that were taken out uh, you know they 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 become inflated so that leads to um uh, a lot of people defaulting on their loans um, and uh, also the uh, housing construction, uh, you know, the, the sudden end of the liquidity uh, stalls uh, housing construction in uh, uh, Astana and Almaty. So you end up uh, having, uh, you know, large uh, groups of uh, uh, what are locally known as ipotechniki and dolshiki uh, that, uh, you know, have now this uh, large debt and, uh, you know, the banks are expecting them to uh, keep, uh, you know, making payments, but they're unable to do so. Um, the, um, well, uh, about 450 uh, housing projects uh, uh, were unfinished uh, and, uh, um, the banks engage in uh, aggressive housing repossessions. Uh, so that's what leads to the emergence of uh, uh, social movements. Uh, there were many uh, smaller mobilizations in, in various uh, uh, cities, but the largest ones that sort of then ended up sort of consolidating uh, the smaller um, um, movements were uh, Kazakhstan 2012, uh, led, led by Aynur Kurmanov, who is um, uh, sort of a leftist, leftist activist and uh, the head of the um, socialist resistance uh, movement in uh, uh, Kazakhstan. And the other uh, sort of large movement that emerged was Astavim Narodu Zhilyo, uh, which uh, uh, later expanded uh, also to other uh, cities in uh, Kazakhstan. And uh, uh, the movements here were organized by uh, urban uh, middle classes and urban working classes. In uh, Kyrgyzstan, uh, the, the movements were mobilized largely uh, in the regions by rural women. And uh, uh, initially, uh, these uh, sort of localized uh, mobilizations uh, were, um, uh, were negotiating with the banks uh, and then at some point uh, uh, because this uh, negotiations failed uh, sort of you know locally uh, mobilized to prevent evictions uh, so again uh, it, it, it's the housing repossession that uh, pushed women uh, to uh, uh, mobilize. And in uh, uh, 2012, uh, they realized that, you know, this localized mobilization um, is ineffective and they indeed uh, need to gain um, access to the state and they travel to Bishkek. And in 2012, they gain access to the parliamentary committee on uh, economic and fiscal policy. Uh, which then urges uh, these uh, women to uh, collect evidence um, of uh, uh, fraudulent practices of the financial sector and uh, uh, sort of assess the scale of uh, housing repossessions, which then, then leads them to sort of, you know, uh, further uh, consolidation. And that's when they formally uh, sort of label themselves as uh, the People's Committee for the Protection of Borrowers' Rights. And uh, uh, the, their interaction with the parliamentary committee then sort of you know pushes their expansion uh, into the regions, and they open branches in uh, uh, all seven regions uh, after 2012. Um, the um, the dynamics of the. Um, uh, social movements of the anti debt movement in, in Kazakhstan um, actually, you know, uh, linked it to uh, the, you know, uh, class plus differences. Um, as um, these initially, there was this, um, they, uh, the, the um, middle classes and the uh, working classes, they, they protested uh, together and they um, um, uh, sort of work together. However, um, uh, as as uh, they um, began deliberating on on uh, their demands and uh, on their strategies, 
then you ended up getting class divergences. And the original Astavim Narodu Zhilyo movement uh, then gets fragmented and uh, the uh, sort of middle class component of it, um, um, headed by um, Elmira Skakova, um, it, 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 uh, they leave and they uh, set up their own movement uh, uh, labeled as Kazakhstan Mahjdom. Um, and uh, the other um, uh, sort of uh, um, component of the original movement, again, they sort of, you know, uh, uh, leave and uh, uh, she sets up like a clone uh, 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 movement uh, titled Abyspeci Narod Zhilyom. And uh, the, um, the differences in their um, uh, demands, uh, you know, are quite visible. So um, the Astavi uh, Naroda Julio movement uh, it actually wanted debt amnesty, nationalization of banks, and uh, 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 creation of state-owned construction company. And uh, in, in, uh, when it came to their strategies, they actually um, made an alliance with uh, uh, Kazakhstan 2012, and uh, they um, mobilize their efforts uh, on trying to uh, elect uh, an opposition party into the parliament in uh, 2012 parliamentary elections. Um, urban uh, um, middle class activists uh, did not protest. They uh, really wanted to distance, distance themselves uh, from um, oppositional parties in particular. Um, and this was um, probably because the state signaled uh, to all the social movements that uh, the state is willing to recognize uh, their economic grievances as long as they're not politicized. So um, urban middle classes, uh, then, you know, all they claimed was that, uh, that they wanted temporary uh, deferral of payment, lowering of interest rates, uh, conversion of uh, uh, dollar denominated dollars into tenge uh, loans. And um, they more or less focused on uh, um, what they called pragmatic solutions and constructive dialogue. And they ended up negotiating uh, with, uh, 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 well, key political institutions like Noratan and the National Bank. I've um, speech in Arad Zhilyom, headed by Solibika uh, Shalikova, also, um, Sort of distance itself from politics. They they were very um, uh, they emphasized. They were very keen on uh, sort of stating uh, stating that uh, um, they have nothing to do with politics. Um, but they did want partial debt amnesty to social vulnerable groups, and uh, you know lowering of the interest rates um, and refinancing of the loans. So this kind of um, class divergence actually ends up, ends up undermining anti-debt social movements in Kazakhstan and uh, uh, weakening their uh, bargaining with the state. So here are some of the um, images uh, which uh, show the different protests, uh, the different uh, uh, social movements uh, carried out. Uh, hunger strikes were carried out by Stavim Naroda Zhilyo. Um, these, these women uh, that you see with gray sacks in, on their heads and uh, sort of uh, ropes around their necks, um, these were the kind of performative politics uh, organized by Abyspeci um, Naroda Zhilyo. They were quite well known in Almaty uh, for um, this type of protests. Uh, and. Uh, essentially this movement tried to shame uh, the government into um, uh, supporting um, indebted uh, uh, borrowers. And uh, here are the uh, protests that were organized by uh, Kazakhstan uh, 2012. The anti-debt movement in Kyrgyzstan uh, did not have the kind of uh, class divergences that occurred uh, in Kazakhstan, and that's largely because the social base uh, for that movement uh, consisted of uh, uh, rural uh, women, uh, working class uh, rural women. And uh, from the very uh, beginning, they actually, you know, uh, made uh, sort of a coherent set of demands. And uh, when they were working with the 
the parliamentary committee, uh, they uh, you know presented this document, uh, you know saying that we have seven concrete demands and uh, uh, we would like you to uh, uh, you know take this uh, to the parliament and to um, you know uh, introduce to the changes to the um, financial regulation. And initially, the women, if uh, you can see, did not ask for debt amnesty. They were more concerned about stopping uh, the repossession of uh, homes. So um, the demands that they ma made were actually sort of centered around that, to ban lenders from uh, repossessing uh, homes, especially if it was the only uh, housing uh, that the family possessed, to uh, pass individual bankruptcy laws, um, to establish a state fund that would uh, uh, offer alternative affordable long-term loans um, to prohibit passing of debt obligations to other family members, um, prevent uh, lenders uh, taking uh, you know, repayments from pensions and welfare payments, to uh, prohibit proliferation of pawn shops and uh, informal lenders, which, you know, really mushroomed uh, in Kyrgyzstan. And, uh, you know, till today, uh, the National Bank is, uh, you know, doesn't really um, regulate uh, you know, this uh, shadow banking sector. And uh, also then, you know, um, restore the rights of um, uh, housing rights of, of uh, uh, many families that lost uh, their houses. And, uh, you know, this actually led to uh, very heated debates uh, uh, within Kyrgyz parliament. And, uh, uh, you know, uh, Umar who was, um, uh, you know, quite sympathetic to the demands uh, of uh, uh, the anti debt movement, um, you know, uh, in engaged in, you know, uh, fierce contestation with the uh, um, National Bank and the uh, the financial lobby, the very strong financial lobby uh, in the parliament. All these heated debates uh, ended with the um, law in 2013. Almaz uh, Katambaev uh, passed the anti-usury law, which capped the interest rates to 35 percent. Now, the women actually did not see uh, the that outcome as an achievement. They felt that they were cheated and they carried on uh, with um, their mobilization and uh, uh, with um, their demands. And um, to, um, uh, to, to a certain extent, it also led to uh, radicalization uh, of, of, of the movement. And uh, uh, at some point, um, when, when they were really trying to understand the roots, you know, why is it that the state is unable to um, uh, to, to um, you know, satisfy their demands, they realized actually, you know, uh, that uh, there are, uh, you know, international powers involved here, and, uh, uh, you know, um, and that there is only so much uh, that uh, um, the state could do. So then that lets, leads to uh, the shifting in their demands, and, you know, uh, and, and the shift in the location of their protest. They no longer protest in front of the White House, but they take to their protest to uh, 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 US Embassy. Uh, and uh, um, in later uh, stages, they actually now demand the reform of the entire financial system and uh, eradication of the MFIs that were set up uh, by the um, international financial institutions. If uh, uh, sort of we would try to summarize the kind of uh, uh, concessions social uh, anti debt social movements gained in Kazakhstan and Kyrgyzstan, uh, well, they are sort of fairly modest. Uh, in 2009, the Kazakhstani state allocates uh, 2.8 billion to complete all those. Uh, uh, unfinished uh, housing projects. Uh, this wasn't enough, and there are still a lot of them unfinished. Um, the state allocates about uh, 345 million to refinance uh, mortgage loans. This helps out roughly uh, only 28,000 borrowers, um, the majority of whom were actually middle class. 
uh, it didn't really uh, affect uh, socially vulnerable groups. And if you could compare this uh, sort of you know, rescue package to the kind of bailing out uh, that um, uh, uh, Kazakhstani banks received, I mean, the Kazakhstani st state spent 19 billion uh, to bail out banks and uh, um, you know so uh, the ordinary people didn't really get uh, the help uh, that they were asking for and the interest rates in Kazakhstan were kept at 60 um, percent uh, in Kyrgyzstan uh, we have the cap the capping of interest rates at 25 percent uh, 99 MFIs were closed and I suppose you know these are um, and the, the sort of uh, the difference is that in, in Kyrgyzstan, the Kyrgyzstani uh, state uh, set up uh, a committee on uh, borrowers' rights, uh, which is a, a special sort of uh, designated institution where the borrowers now can come with their um, uh, grievances and, uh, you know, um, if they've been uh, uh, defrauded and uh, you know uh, there are obvious cases of uh, malpractices this committee investigates uh, them and uh, uh, but it, it it has you know it can make only make recommendations it doesn't have any mandatory powers over the uh, uh, financial institutions the state also promised to draft individual bankruptcy laws, but uh, it's been three years and, uh, you know, uh, we, we don't really see uh, that um, that's, that's likely to happen. We meet up five minutes. Okay, and this is the final Thank slide. It's, it's good. I think uh, I'm, I'm, I'm doing okay on time. So, you know, sort of conclusion, I'd like to uh, offer some theoretical insights based on our research and um, uh, you know, the, the key um, insight that emerges uh, from, from uh, our research is that uh, social movements in Central Asia uh, emerge in response to all these uh, uh, commodification processes. So social struggles and social movements, they cannot be explained merely through local uh, frames and, uh, you know, dominant uh, uh, conceptualizations such as patron clientelism don't really capture uh, the social movements. Uh, the social movements are very much, you know, anti-rontier in their nature. They have emerged independent of elites and uh, were often led by women. So, you know, again, you know, patron clientelism or subversive clientelism doesn't really um, explain uh, social movements and, uh, you know, doesn't uh, take into account that uh, the gendered nature of these movements. Um, the state is dominated by the rentier class and transnational capital. Uh, so, you know, um, framings of uh, I don't know, patronage straight state and uh, authoritarianism, uh, again, don't really capture it. Uh, I think these are plutocratic regimes. And if we are using uh, concepts of authoritarianism and illiberalism, at the very least, they need to be linked to uh, external factors and not explained purely uh, due to inter internal ones. And uh, with social movements, I think it's important to keep in mind that although they did achieve fairly, uh, you know, uh, modest concessions, they are nevertheless, um, you know, articulating very important concerns, and so they shouldn't be assessed purely on the basis of their longevity or transformative powers. You know, the the the, the power imbalance between the social movements and uh, uh, the laissez-faire. Uh, forces is is massive it's huge it really is a battle of uh, i don't know david and goliath and we can't expect uh you know local movements in central asia to take on uh the power of the transnational capital but the very fact that they emerged and that they struggled for such a long time is important and uh, we need to you know reflect on this and and um, um and uh you know um uh appreciate it so I'm going to stop here. Thank you. Thank you, Almira. Um, shall we unshare your screen so we can? Yes, stop sharing. Um, and I'll...
All right, uh, the floor is open. Thank you so much for a very insightful talk. Uh, um, such you know, so much rich data involved. So I'm going to try to unpin you so we can see the gallery or maybe Montu can do that. There you go. Um, I'll do it, it's okay. Yeah, yeah. okay. Um, all right, um, please go ahead. Um, like I said, there are questions in so the chat. There's a question in the chat now, okay. So ba um, Buzz Beck. Uh, I think is the first one. He wants to. Uh, I the Buzzbeck doesn't show up in mine, but okay. Buzzbeck, would you like to Hello, ask? Yeah. Yeah, Hello. Uh, yeah, I have a question about uh, the role of Sadr Japarov in uh, any of these movements. Mm. The president. Okay. Shall I answer now? Or yes, please. Sure. Yeah, we'll, we'll do one question at a time. Yes, oh, One question at a time. Yes, thank you. Um, Sadir Parov uh, played a role in uh, the third movement, which I haven't discussed in this talk, uh, the, uh, in Kyrgyzstan, the um, emergence of the um, uh, movement in Isikul uh, that uh, uh, demanded nationalization of uh, Kumpur, uh, the largest uh, uh, mining uh, company uh, owned by the Canadian Sinter company. Um, so, and, and that actually probably explains his, um, uh, you know, political legitimacy with uh, uh, the large groups in Kyrgyzstan. So he uh, played a role, but not necessarily uh, from the very start. Uh, it's only in, uh, you know, 2010, when he, um, you know, realizes uh, the the uh, the kind of grievances uh, that uh, people had about the extractive se sector in Kyrgyzstan, and perhaps he even, you know, decides to capitalize on these grievances. Uh, the 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 original movements that emerged uh, in Kyrgyzstan against the extractive sector again they were organized by local communities. Uh, some of them were led by women in Isikul, uh, but we're talking about multiple uh, uh, local uh, resistance to the extractive sector in Kyrgyzstan. Okay, thank you. Mm -hmm. Okay, the next question is in chat. It's from uh, Ilyas uh, Mamidyarov. Uh, the question is, what do you think explains Kyrgyzstan central bank's reluctance to regulate uh, till today the shadow banking sector in the country? Uh, this is in reference to your mushroomed pawn shop slide informal loans that are present. Yeah, that's a good question. Well, what explains that is a very uh, strong uh, financial lobby in uh, uh, Kyrgyzstan. So, uh, you know, uh, first of all, uh, there are a lot of uh, MPs uh, within the parliament that actually own uh, microcredit. Uh, companies and uh, uh, perhaps even even you know these uh, pawn shops. Uh, so clearly there is a clash of interests. Um, secondly, there are also the national bank is very much against uh, this regulation, and the national bank is under the influence of the IMF. Um, so you know, it, it, how are you going to regulate the sector when the re the key regulator itself? Uh, is arguing against it. Um, and then you also have, uh, you know, uh, there is, for instance, microfinance association, a very strong sector. There is an association of uh, um, bankers uh, and they all have a, a presence, uh, you know, uh, the, the business council. So the financial lobby uh, has regular meetings actually with, with uh, almost weekly meetings with uh, uh, the political elites in, in Kyrgyzstan. And uh, they they are you know fiercely against it. So it's um, uh, also uh, in addition to all of this, you have uh, um, you know experts from the IMF and World Bank saying that uh, the state shouldn't intervene. Uh, these are uh, market mechanisms, uh, and you know it, it should things should be left alone. And uh, you know the state inter intervention is undesirable. All right, thank you, Almira. Uh, the next question is also in chat uh, uh, from um, Reshim Singh Sandhu. His question is, 
uh, what is the situation now in the two countries? Are foreign investors welcomed uh, to invest in construction? Uh, are they safe from local groups, uh, local gangs or mafias? And thank you for your talk. Oh, okay. Well, yes, of course. So you actually have like, you know, the tyranny of the FDI, uh, you know, uh, uh, the uh, both governments are, you know, the whole agenda actually is to uh, how to attract more uh, foreign capital in, into the country. And uh, unfortunately, you know, uh, Sadir Japarov, who is seen, you know, as um, uh, probably someone, you know, who's uh, going to introduce some protective measures. No, he's going, uh, you know, uh, along the same lines and, uh, you know, uh, seeking uh, international investments. And yes, uh, you know, the, the uh, real estate uh, sector picked up again. Uh, there, there is, uh, you know, uh, now uh, more investment going into the um, uh, real estate sector. Again, more so in Kazakhstan uh, than in Kyrgyzstan. Uh, now in Kyrgyzstan, you have the presence of Chinese construction companies, uh, in addition with uh, Turkish construction companies. Um, uh, in Kazakhstan, you know, these construction companies, they're not sort of, uh, uh, owned by the mafia, it's it's uh, you know uh, there is business elites, uh, and you do have this kind of convergence of uh, political elites and uh, business elites. So, for instance, uh, some of the construction companies were opened by um, again parliamentarians, and uh, you know like the deputy head of Nuratan had a very large construction company. Actually, uh, one of the um, sort of construction companies that got defrauded in Astana uh, was opened by a former parliamentarian, uh, Azbuka Zhilya. Uh, so it was responsible for eight, uh, building uh, eight uh, housing complexes. Uh, he raised about a hundred million dollars from about 2000 shareholders uh, and then um, disappeared. He's currently in Austria. And, uh, uh, you know, the prosecutor's office is trying to extradite him. And somehow um, he's still in Austria. Okay, uh, there are lots of questions in chat now. Would anybody like to raise their hands uh, and actually ask their own questions? We'd be happy to do that as well. But I'll ask the next question uh, while you think about that. Uh, Rune Steenberg asks, uh, could you explain why the interest rates in Central Asia are so high, not just for microloans, but also more generally? It's linked to the um, scarcity of uh, money as capital. So, um, because, um, well, uh, international capital has monopoly on uh, uh, money, uh, you know, uh, attracting it comes at this kind of cost. Uh, so, and, and there isn't really a good reason for um, the, the kind of usurious rates uh, that they come with. It really is more of a political decision. And uh, it's, it's, uh, it's, 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 you know, it's, it's a form of rent. So if, uh, uh, you know, um, international lenders can get away uh, with, uh, you know, imposing this kind of uh, uh, high interest rates, then they do that. So they're, they're not concerned about, you know, how this affects uh, local population. They're actually quite well aware that uh, uh, this has, uh, you know, disastrous consequences uh, on, on the local population. When we interviewed them, when we spoke to them, uh, they were aware, they were, uh, you know, um, somewhat, you know, uncomfortable about it, but then they said, look, it's all due to market mechanisms. If, 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 uh, if, if the market, um, you know, it, it's all about the supply and demand. And, and uh, you know, um, so the, the scarcity of commodity determines the price. And uh, that's why they are so high. Uh, okay, uh, thank you, Elmira. Um, uh, sorry, there seems to be some confusion about people not being able to raise their hands. I'm hoping that they can find it in the reactions or the more option. Mm -hmm. uh, but Asel uh, Dolat Kildieva, please go ahead uh, if you can unmute yourself. Yes, um, Elmira, thank you so much for such a great presentation. Uh, really learned a lot. Uh, my question is about the uh, resource mobilization theory which look exactly at the, uh, at the resources uh, which are scarce, 
uh, available to poor people and the poor community. And um, I think partly those patron client um, explanations uh, of social mobilizations in Central Asia are due to this uh, theory that simply uh, due to scarce resources available to um, communities, uh, they are kind of uh, experiencing really heavy obstacles to collective action. Um, I'm not trying to defend uh, by any means the pattern crime uh, theories here. I uh, just wanted to ask whether you, um, in your research, have um, uh, observed that uh, scarce resources were impacting their um, collective actions by poor communities. And if yes, then in which way it was impacting? Thank you. I, I see. What do you mean by scarce resources? I mean, uh, are, we, are we talking about the kind of uh, the payment by the elites uh, for? Oh, no, no, no. no. Um, so there, there is an abandoned literature which looks at the resources available to communities, such as time, uh, such mm -hmm. as material uh, resources needed to organize collective action, food provision, shelter provision, mm -hmm. and many other things which kind of are much more affordable to the middle class. And that's why you can observe also more durable movements uh, because the poor communities uh, lack uh, such resources according to the theory, this would, this would limit uh, their collective action. Mm -hmm. Well, uh, the, the thing is, I'm, I'm a bit skeptical about uh, this, um, I suppose, you know, scarce resource uh, mobilization theories because it doesn't add up. Uh, with middle classes, they clearly had uh, more resources and, uh, you know, uh, uh, better um, cultural capital, um, you know, to negotiate uh, with, with um, various institutions. And uh, what they do, they end up uh, sort of, um, um, they, they're, they're less interested in, in, in uh, you know, sort of activism and, uh, uh, and much of the uh, difficult struggles are uh, carried out uh, by the uh, poor groups that are lacking resources. Um, so, uh, you know, I, I don't think that, um, you know, uh, the scarcity of resources sort of explains everything. And I think here it's it's more important to uh, uh, pay attention, you know. Uh, so you know how, why is it why is it why is it, you know, the the um, the dispossessed uh, are you know uh, more more proactive and more efficient uh, with with um, well at least in Kyrgyzstan uh, with with uh, their strategies, and uh, a lot of that actually you know uh, has to do with um, the extent of desperation. Uh, so um, it's just that, you know, they were under uh, so much pressure uh, and uh, uh, that, that they had to do something about it. Um, whereas, you know, uh, with other groups, you know, uh, they weren't. Um, and in, in terms of resources, I mean, they, uh, this is probably why they were um, actually looking for alliances uh, with, uh, um, uh, you know, uh, well, leading uh, oppositional parties, um, particularly with parties like, you know, uh, Alga and Azad, uh, which, which are, uh, you know, uh, fairly rich. Uh, um, they're, they're, you know, uh, organized by, um, well, set up by oligarchs. Uh, and the thing is, you know, those, those alliances, uh, did not take place, uh, and uh, um, they, they, you know, they weren't interested in in uh, having solidarity uh, with uh, a particular class of people. So, um, so yeah. So I don't know if that answers your question. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Thank you, Elmira. Okay, uh, Oyuna Baldakova, would you like to unmute yourself? No, maybe. Yes, hello. Uh, thank you so much for such an excellent talk. I have a question about the land protests in Kazakhstan uh, in 2016 and the recent anti-Chinese protests, uh, bo both in Kazakhstan and Kyrgyzstan. 
do you see any similarities between you know the social bases of the ones uh, that you were talking about in the early 2000s and the ones that happened later uh, thank you I have not followed uh, anti-Chinese protests in Kazakhstan. So I can't really uh, compare uh, the two. So um, it, it's, uh, you know, um, it would be unfair to compare the two. I just, don't, I just uh, you know, don't, don't really know what drives the um, anti-Chinese protests in, in uh, uh, both in Kyrgyzstan and Kazakhstan. Um, it, it, if, if, if we are, for instance, talking about the uh, in Kyrgyzstan extractive industries, so it's, and, and that's a different story. Uh, they're not about land. Uh, and uh, in, in, this, in this respect, the, the resistance uh, against uh, Chinese companies is, you know, on the same grounds as the resistance against, you know, the Canadian ones. So, you know, you know extractive, you know, capital is, you know, uh, uh, doing uh, the kind of damage that uh, you know local communities are trying to prevent, and uh, and, and they don't really you know uh, differentiate on, on, on in, in this regard. Um, but I don't know much about the um, uh, what is it um, protests uh, against um, um, I suppose allocation of land to Chinese businesses in Kazakhstan. Thank you, um, Asel Tutumlu. You're next. Thank you. Um, Ilmir, thanks for the great talk. I was just wondering that if you see um, a kind of a historical trajectory of more neoliberalization or commercialization um, in Central Asia, mm -hmm. uh, particularly in Kazakhstan, and how uh, this increased um, uh, neoliberalism leads to more protests. Uh, because it seems to me that uh, Kazakhstan over time, especially at the late era of Nazarbayev, has been decreasing the amount of social spending and the welfare spending. Mm -hmm. And uh, with every kind of decrease of the welfare, there ha we have seen um, a relative increase in, in social protest. Um, so do, first of all, so I guess I have two questions. First, do you see the increased neoliberalization? Um, and uh, or is this, uh, uh, which, which causes the increase of the welfare, um, uh, protests for the welfare? Uh, or do you just simply see that neo uh, neoliberalism may be the same, but the uh, people uh, are so dispossessed that they begin to claim the more welfare? Um, whether there is increase of neoliberalization in, in Kazakhstan, it's... Um, uh, it's more or less, you know, uh, well, probably. I mean, the, the commodification uh, uh, trends are, um, you know, now, you know, deeply, deeply rooted. And, and uh, if we're particularly looking at the extractive sector, uh, it uh, looks like uh, that Kazakhstani government is, uh, uh, you know, looking to expand it. Uh, the, uh, you know, oil resources uh, are, um, you know what drives the the uh, Kazakhstan economy, and uh, uh, perhaps you know because the um, the budget and the revenue and uh, sort of uh, you know the fiscal policies in, in in Kazakhstan are so dependent on the um, you know uh, the export of oil and the sale of oil, um, and and Kazakhstan doesn't see yet its way of getting out. Of uh, the, this 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 uh, uh, sort of you know form of capital accumulation, uh, the, the the trend of neoliberalization is 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 going to um, at the very least continue, if not increase. Um, the now the drop in the oil prices and and which is also linked to COVID uh, is affecting the the budget. And uh, yes, uh, so there were uh, cuts to social spending. Uh, but, uh, you know, uh, on, on the one hand, uh, you know, uh, I, I find that Kazakhstan elites are very careful about, uh, you know, uh, their, their tactics. Uh, they, for instance, um, might reduce uh, welfare spending, but at the same time, when, uh, for instance, um, uh, um, 
the new president uh, uh, Kasimov was, uh, uh, you know, uh, campaigning for presidential election, they, uh, you know, uh, devised the policy that uh, wiped out uh, uh, the debt, the consumer debt, of something like, uh, you know, three hundred thousand people. So, you know, the 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 state tends to make concessions uh, uh, around. Uh, you know, parliamentary and presidential elections. It also, you know, assesses the, the sort of, you know, the, the, um, the kind of mobilization that is taking place in, 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 in Kazakhstan. And in Kazakhstan, uh, you know, if you, if you think about it, the years uh, 2000, 2007, 2008, 2009, and then the Janauzin events, these were all, you know, uh, uh, crisis years uh, for the political aid. There was quite a bit of mobilization. Nevertheless, you know, the state managed to, you know, squash uh, uh, quite a, a bit of resistance. So, uh, I, the, 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 there is a decline now, uh, you know, it's, it's linked to, uh, of social protests and that's linked to criminalization of uh, uh, unsanctioned protests and, and, uh, and uh, they're, they're um, you know, uh, most likely, I don't know, it's going to depend again on the kind of um, uh, crisis that's going to take place in, in Kazakhstan again in the next, uh, uh, I don't know, uh, five or ten years. And uh, uh, neoliberalization tends to have, uh, you know, this, this spikes of a crisis. And it's quite possible that, you know, uh, this, this, this uh, social protest will increase again. At the moment, they're on the, de on the decline. Right. Um, Fabian, um, would you like to unmute yourself? Yes. Okay, first of all, I need to apologize because yeah, due to my teaching commitments, I could only tune in very late. Um, but um, yeah, I was wondering if, if we could perhaps elaborate a little bit mm -hmm. on the role of social movements or grassroots movements more generally in uh, responding to or addressing the corona crisis in Kyrgyzstan. And I was also wondering whether there were any new movements created since the start of the corona crisis. Which crisis? Covid crisis? Corona. Uh, COVID. Yeah, yeah, COVID. 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 Um, I would say that the, the Covid crisis exacerbated uh, the existing ones. And uh, um, and uh, in, in Kyrgyzstan, I would say that uh, the Covid uh, crisis, um, you know, um, added to existing pressures and led to the third political uprising. Um, in uh, uh, Kazakhstan, it, it doesn't seem to have the same effect uh, for some reason. Um, uh, and uh, it's, it's, it's probably due to all the uh, repressive measures that uh, were introduced, but at the same time, it's probably due to the fact that uh, some, some of the, uh, the government actually, you know, allocated uh, a bit of money uh, to support uh, sort of uh, the um, households in, 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 in Kazakhstan. Um, the Kyrgyz government didn't do any of that. Uh, and uh, people were more or less left uh, to uh, deal with this crisis on their own. Um, and uh, it, it, what COVID exposed is the complete collapse of the sort of the uh, welfare system, uh, you know, uh, healthcare in particular. So um, I think I think that it just added to um, um, the social movements that were on the ground, which then uh, you know led to um, political mobilization and and uh, you know uh, culminated in the third. Uh, um, political uprising in Kyrgyzstan. Okay, thank you. Um, Tina, uh, you're next. Uh, hello, Elmira. Uh, many thanks for this very interesting presentation. We are all filled with compassion for the plight of the people of Kazakhstan and Kyrgyzstan and wish them success in their just struggle. I have two questions. You uh, mentioned that um, uh, they have at one point there was a participation, hard-won participation, 
in the Political Committee for Economic and Social Policy. Uh, was there an opportunity to uh, make such um, participation a permanent feature and such interaction with the civil society a permanent feature of this committee uh, to become a regular venue and provide, give a chance to the to society, a broad society to provide input on policies to policy makers? Um, and uh, also what has been the participation of the trade unions in this struggle? Thank you. Um, no, the, um, the, the, the relationship with the uh, parliamentary committee uh, was uh, unfortunately um, short-lived. Um, well, you know, it, it lasted about um, a year. Um, and the, the, the permanent uh, committee that exists now is the Committee on uh, Borrowers' Rights. So uh, the, uh, uh, the borrowers were actually, you know, um, you know uh, I suppose, discouraged from uh, um, accessing the parliament and, and, and hence this, in, this entire new institution was created so that they could take their grievances uh, to that particular institution. And, uh, and, and it has its uh, branches now in uh, pretty much all regions. And uh, uh, the, the idea is that uh, a lot of these uh, problems uh, need to be resolved on the ground uh, without ever sort of reaching uh, the, uh, the capital. Um, in terms of trade unions, um, uh, I, they were not, you know, part of the, um, uh, of, of at least the, the kind of movements that I'm talking about. Uh, it might be that they are uh, mobilizing separately uh, uh, around the issues that are affecting them. Uh, the, the, you know, anti-debt movement in Kyrgyzstan is very much based on uh, rural borrowers. Okay, um, we have Kelly next. Kelly, are you going to unmute yourself? Can you hear me? Yes. Okay. Thank you, Amira, for such an insightful talk. That was so much rich detail. Um, I don't know if it'd be worthwhile to pull up your slides again, because um, I was interested in one of the images that you used. Um, I believe it was from the, towards the end, um, from some of the shifts in demand in Kyrgyzstan and some of the protest signs that were, that you showed there, but I was just struck by, um, some of them, they Which said- uh, Is it this one? Yes. Yeah, okay. so um, just was really struck by how you see signs with Occupy Finca or um, yeah, humans above profits. And so language and ideas that you'd see in other more global social movements and yes. across the West and um, Latin America. So I was wondering, I guess there's several aspects of my yeah. question. I mean, this picture says, explains so much of what you were arguing that we can't just continue to explain these these social movements based on internal factors that this is global and this kind of explains mm -hmm. a lot of that in um, my impression but um, I guess one question is how what these kind of alliances were the nature of these alliances if it was if they were sought and how they sort of arrived in in Kyrgyzstan in general and if you saw some of this similar um, outreach or I guess, import of ideas in Kazakhstan as well. But um, then within this, um, I guess, did you, within all of these social movements that you've been tracking for so long, have you seen other sort of proposals put forward in terms of based on other interpretations of this is how a home is envisioned or um, are the struggles still rooted in trying to um, effectively survive within a neoliberal framework or are there more long-term visions being put forward within these social movements or is mm -hmm. either of them just simply there's so much precarity within them that it's very difficult to formulate a lot of these ideas or mm -hmm. you see some of that in any of the movements that you looked at but thank you very much for a great talk
So the nature of alliances actually um, uh, in, uh, in when you talk about the nature of alliances, do you mean uh, the alliances with the global movements, uh, whether they manage to do, to, to, or do you mean the internal ones? Uh, more the external, and it could be anything that you observed, like how, yeah. did, did they arrive or did was there outreach on the part of local um, stakeholders in Bishkek or in Osh or, yeah, it just was very striking to see those. Yeah. I'll, I'll just add a bit to Kali's thing to, I think the clarification uh, may be necessary in terms of thinking about it, that are they globally influenced or globally driven? Okay. And, and, and which, you know, uh, where we draw the line here. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Mm-hmm. We can trace the global influence in Kyrgyzstan and, and again at a, a fairly late stage. Um, initially they weren't. Uh, initially they're, they're very much uh, these homegrown uh, movements that are reacting to housing uh, repossessions and uh, the initial steps were very much localized. Uh, and and, and, and uh, Kyrgyzstani movement, anti-debt movement stands out in its ability to uh, critically assess um, the, uh, you know, who to attribute the blame for the situation. So initially they couldn't really understand that the banks were, you know, that unregulated. They really believed that the state and the national bank regulated them. So they, they kept appealing to the, um, you know, state uh, uh, officials and to the National Bank, uh, telling them, look, uh, we are experiencing all these uh, problems, so you need to step in and do something about it. So they were shocked when they learned that neither the National Bank uh, nor the parliament had the powers to um, intervene. Uh, and, and uh, you know, uh, the, the National Bank can't tell to, uh, you know, uh, the financial industry, you need to, uh, you know, cancel the debts. We, we're, we're, you know, uh, uh, we're going to, you know, launch the program of debt amnesty, or you need to, you know, uh, uh, sort of um, uh, reduce your um, uh, um, commission penalties. So they just, they just don't have the kind of power. Uh, and... Uh, um, so, so then they then they started, you know, um, I suppose interrogating this further and further, and at some point, this is this is the important moment. They actually met uh, some of the um, experts uh, uh, who um, more or less explained to them that uh, uh, the the power of uh, um, the World Bank and uh, the international capital and uh, and uh, and and how these microfinance institutions were set up in the first place. So they didn't even understand that, for instance, uh, uh, let's say Baitushum was a small, tiny NGO uh, in 1995, was a staff of 10 people. And uh, you know that the, the funding for that particular NGO came from the USAID. They didn't know any of this, but they get to learn this. Uh, around uh, 2015 and 2016, uh, because they end up uh, uh, talking to um, you know uh, various local um, uh, uh, economic experts, and in particular one uh, you know sort of uh, ended up sort of engaging with their movement, and and that particular. Uh, uh, expert, he actually had a background in, in, in uh, uh, he worked for the international agencies uh, for a long time. And uh, uh, it sounds like he was quite unsatisfied uh, with the, um, uh, you know, monetary policy in, in Kyrgyzstan. He actually even had his own sort of program. And, and so he ends up, you know, uh, engaging with this uh, movement in, in Kyrgyzstan and uh, guiding them uh, uh, in, 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 in a sense that, you know, uh, we, we need to shift the attention to these international actors. Um, and and it's, it's, it's that particular expert that uh, was aware of the global movements. He was aware of the uh, Occupy movement in Wall Street. Um, he was aware of the um, anti-debt movements that emerged in uh, Latin America, um, uh, in Bangladesh particular. And, and it's, it was his kind of like a contribution uh, where, you know, uh, they, they, they start sort of, um, you know, uh, uh, reshaping their demands and shifting uh, their demands. 
Um, uh, but, um, you know, in terms of, for instance, uh, getting access, they were, they were searching for um, international organizations um, that would, you know, um, have similar goals as, as, as they did. And they actually uh, failed to, to, to make those global links. Uh, this is quite different, let's say, from the um, social movement uh, against the extractive sector. Their local movements managed to attract quite a lot of environmental, global environmental movements not one but like you know a range of them and they were very important and instrumental in you know in, in helping them and in, in, in sort of you know uh, getting their message out they actually financially supported uh, you know some of their campaigns uh, helped them to devise effective media messages and 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 etc uh, so the anti-debt movement was was searching for those kind of global partners um, and they were quite frustrated, they weren't getting any. And they even tried to, you know, um, get access to all the local NGOs that are working on human rights and approach them saying, you know, surely our rights are also human rights. <laughs> Why are we ignoring, uh, uh, you know, us? You know, uh, you're, you're so keen on particular kind of human rights. And, uh, you know, while we're not part of your attention and your focus, uh, come on, help us out. And, uh, you know, they, 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 were, they were ignored. Um, and, and in terms of alternative messages, again, uh, the uh, Kyrgyzstani anti-debt movement stands out. So uh, the, the Kyrgyzstani anti-debt movement has a very strong um, sort of alternative vision of how the financial sector should operate. And they are more or less appealing to the Soviet uh, sort of, you know, experience where the Soviet Union had very strong anti-usury laws. They were part of the anti um anti-parasitic laws uh, that were passed in uh, 1961. Um, so they use that experience and that knowledge saying that, well, interest rates, rent, uh, capital gains, all this speculation was prohibited in the Soviet Union. And you know we were happier back then. So why are you not introducing the same measures? In a way, we almost know what to do. Uh, we had the tools in the past. Uh, why are you not implementing them now? So, so that's the alternative vision of the uh, anti-debt movement in Kyrgyzstan. In Kazakhstan, probably because of the, you know, the fragmentation and the weakening of the movement and, and the fact that the large middle-class base of the anti-debt movement was very much, it, it internalized all the neoliberal um, ideology and, and they viewed this of themselves as, you know, um, um, Part, they were part of the entrepreneur class and, and they weren't interested in, uh, you know, uh, sort of, you know, thinking uh, a bit more critically and coming up with the alternative vision. But uh, Kazakhstan 2012 and uh, they came sort of close to it uh, until they were uh, kind of crushed. Um, I mean, I was thinking about the same thing that you just mentioned. Uh, my question was going to be, do you think social movements, the way that they are being articulated in Kyrgyzstan, for example, have anything to do with the experience they've had in the Soviet Union? Um, uh, rather than looking for uh, international organizations to actually help this process, it's possible that they need to look into uh, how their own state and community actually remember uh, the Soviet Union, because there is a lot of, uh, I think, disentangling to be done uh, in terms of how they understand what there was, what there can be, and who can actually help that happen. Uh, even in the Indian case, for example, this comes up, uh, social movements very often are uh, led more by the socialist, uh, you know, parties and, and other people. So, um, so anyway, you answered my question, so I'm not going to say any more, but that's, uh, I think that would be something that I would recommend even in your presentation, if you could actually, uh, uh, you know, um, hint at that or, or, or say it more uh, explicitly. I think that would help build a link mm. uh, that I think some of us uh, um, uh, who are not aware of the economics of it could actually follow uh, more closely. But anyway, that's just a, a, a mm -hmm. suggestion. Uh, next question is by Shukrat Kayumov. Are you here? Yes, yeah, Shukrat is here. He's writing to me. I'm okay. mute. <laughs> Unmute yourself, ask your question. Uh, after that, Diana, it's you and then Rune. So uh, you're in the list. Uh, I have you. What happened to you, Shukrat? There's a lot of uh, uh, things he wants to say. I don't want to uh, be his mouthpiece, but I'm, I'm, I'll do it if he can't do it. There he is. Yeah. 
<laughs> Hi, uh, it's it's very interesting the presentation you just sent. Actually, uh, the social movement and the political movement, all everything is very much I think is uh, related. And in, in general, the economical situation in, in in Central Asia is going to be more is becoming better and better. But the last uh, political instability in Kyrgyzstan. Uh, wonder me that uh, is it the direct relation between uh, active uh, social movement and political instability in Kyrgyzstan, and if such a activity will be in Kazakhstan or in Uzbekistan, for instance, then uh, it will be it will begin the same political instability and maybe the the current situation the current situation will change, and political instability will bring to the. Uh, to the more economical uh, breakdown uh, down down of the economy, economy. and uh, in the same time uh, I think that uh, stability will depend on the size of the mid class uh, or the mid income class. So uh, in in Kyrgyzstan definitely there is a, a large pool pool of low income class uh, people. So maybe in Kazakhstan because of the oil uh, there is the uh, big size of the mid income class, which make uh, the, the whole system much more stable. Uh, this is just my thought and uh, question. Thanks. Mm -hmm. Okay. Well, um, I'm I'm not as uh, you know. Uh, um, the size of the middle class. I mean, I'm not sure that it's actually uh, larger in Kazakhstan. So a recent study came out that uh, showed that um, 162 individuals in Kazakhstan owned 50% uh, of the wealth uh, in the country. So think about it. This is uh, less than 0.0% uh, of the population, and yet they own, uh, you know, 50% uh, of the nation's wealth. So the uh, the kind of economic inequality that you get uh, in the country is uh, grotesque. Um, the, uh, you know, uh, Kazakhstan also tends to boast uh, a lot saying that its uh, poverty levels are uh, low, uh, but the uh, measurement of the poverty rate in Kazakhstan is, uh, uh, you know, uh, quite political. It's linked to the uh, consumption bucket uh, and, uh, and uh, uh, you know, it's, 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 it's really a tool for the political elite to manipulate these numbers. So there are other studies that actually show that the um, size of, uh, uh, of, the, of, of, the, of the poor in, in Kazakhstan, uh, you know, is actually quite significant, it's something close to 60 to 70 percent. Uh, the middle class is probably bigger in Kazakhstan than, than in Kyrgyzstan, that's true. Um, however, I would still argue, again, there was a, a recent study that showed the, um, uh, that 4% uh, of, of uh, uh, Kazakhstani population had enough of uh, income uh, to, uh, you know, uh, uh, to sustain itself, you know, let's say it, it was linked to this kind of the COVID crisis, you know, how, how what's the percentage of population could sort of survive in, in, uh, in uh, this kind of uh, strenuous conditions and, uh, you know, the study showed that not more than four. So, you know, so uh, on the one hand, you have this, you know, rhetoric that Kazakhstan is just, you know, um, doing well and it, it has, uh, its population is better off. Uh, on the other hand, there are all these studies coming out that show that that's actually not the case. Um, and, um, and the one thing that we know about the middle class is the reason why it's so loyal to the political regime is because it's been co-opted. Uh, Nazarbayev actually, uh, you know, uh, began co-optation of the middle classes uh, back in uh, uh, 2000 uh, with the emergence of the uh, uh, DCK and, uh, you know, um, and, and uh, he actually made several speeches on this saying that, uh, you know, it's, it's, it's important, you know, to, to um, co-op the middle class uh, because, you know, um, uh, it's, it's, it, that's what would ensure the stability of the regime. And to a certain extent, the strategy paid off. Uh, yes, um, uh, I think uh, this kind of worked in, in Kazakhstan. But the political instability, I wouldn't, I wouldn't um, you know, assume that the, the, the political instability in Kyrgyzstan, uh, you know, has um, 
you know this 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 spillover effect uh, because uh, in Kazakhstan the uh, political uh, structures and the political climate there you know the state is far more repressive and coercive it has the means uh, to uh, you know just remember Jean uh, and even the way they treated Shamirak it has the means and even the the you know uh, to a certain extent uh, the the um, it's not doesn't you know it doesn't shy away from from uh, you know uh, oppressing people. Uh, in 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 uh, Kyrgyzstan, the the coercive apparatus of the state of the state is a, a little weaker because uh, you know the the political elites actually didn't invest as much uh, in 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 that as in Kazakhstan, and. Uh, 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 and yes, political instability in Kyrgyzstan is uh, very much again. If you if you look at all these three uh, uprisings that occurred, uh, it's they've been all um, organized by the uh, in the regions by the rural poor. Uh, the uh, you know uh, middle classes played like no part in it, and uh, and uh, um, and and these political uprisings they were very much yes anti anti. Um, uh, well, anti ronti I would say, but you can say anti-oligarchic uh, in their nature. So it was always, you know, the first the first uprising uh, tried to limit uh, the power of the, um, you know, uh, archive uh, sort of uh, um, family, uh, then Maxim Bakiev, and and. Uh, and uh, now we actually have, I think, uh, some kind of, uh, you know. Uh, um, accumulation of grievances that are linked to neoliberalism. It's, it's just like a whole range of things. Um, I don't think that uh, Uzbekistan, uh, again, is, is, is um, under uh, the same um, risk of, of political instability as, as Kyrgyzstan, simply because uh, if you look at the um, expansion of credit uh, in Uzbekistan, you know, banks, 90% of them are owned by the state. Um, so um, you just don't have the same kind of indebtedness uh, as in, uh, uh, well, Kyrgyzstan and Kazakhstan for sure. Um, and uh, and uh, so you, you would just have to assess the, the sort of, you know, the, the, the extent of commodification and liberalization in, 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 in uh, Uzbekistan separately. Um, yeah, I wanted to come in here and say something both uh, in terms of what uh, Shukrat asked and, and, and Elmira's response, but in, in general, mm -hmm. uh, it's quite, uh, how to say, I, I have trouble with the classification, uh, how we uh, decide the, the middle class or, or, or the class structures yes. and the institutional relationships uh, they have and how the notion of elite versus not elite and rural versus urban and so on because the uh, looking at uh, very structurally size of Kazakhstan both in population and, and physicality um, and and the uh, Kyrgyz Republic with its own specific nature of how you know how people are distributed and they're connected and the, and again the size overall size not of a particular class mm -hmm. so the nature of interaction that cuts across uh, and the intensity of interactions that happen between people and their reactions, their grievances, their happiness and so on. It's a, it's a thing that we haven't really considered. We often, you know, this, it, it's, it's quite valid, you know, both of what you're saying, but I think it can't be fully answered ever uh, without looking at what is, when we say elite in Kyrgyz Republic, it's a very different thing from saying an elite in India or elite in the US or elite in Kazakhstan and even elite in Uzbekistan. The, the, the relationships are different and, and how people react to what elite means and what is the agency of elite and what, you know, or what is, whose agency they subsume and what is the internal checks and balances based on other cultural social factors. So, so the, uh, while analysis is important, I mean, this is very good, but the, the final understanding, we need a very different kind of study uh, in, when we try to compare. Uh, is what I mean, and they may they may work on their own, but when we start to cut across, is where the problem comes. Uh, and sometimes it's comparable. We have to work on what is comparable, uh, but but not necessarily just simply compare across in that way. Well, um, it depends again on what your uh, definition of class is. So uh, in our study, we're actually linking it to uh, the ownership of assets. 
And uh, if you if you have that lens, uh, because neoliberalization, and uh, uh, I'm completely on board with that. I have, I'm not questioning that that at all. But yeah. I'm saying ownership, the meaning of, I, I mean, uh, this is a separate <laughs> discussion to be had. So, yeah. so those... I, I agree with the part that you know, uh, class stratification is 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 not straightforward, yeah. and there are various approaches to this. Uh, and uh, you know, uh, uh, what what class means in one setting uh, might mean something else in another. But at the same time, if uh, for instance, you uh, the way we do, if you just focus on. Uh, uh, link uh, neoliberalization to uh, class inequality in terms of ownership of the assets, uh, then a, a lot of these uh, ambiguities actually fall away. And uh, um, if, if you, you know, read the paper that, uh, um, you know, uh, Balihar and I published on the rise of the Rontier class, well, then we're defining, you know, very precisely who the Rontier class is. And they were giving uh, very concrete evidence uh, for. Uh, yeah, no, no, I, 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 I'm not uh, disagreeing with that, but I'm looking at a particular from a more, say, anthropological or sociological aspect that when we say ownership, so ownership doesn't have a, a straightforward. So who is excluded when we, I, when I own something? Yeah. So in in a particular cultural class setting, that whoever that, doesn't have the assets is in, is excluded. Uh, yes. So, so, but yeah. how that, how the benefit of that exclusion, or, or, or rather, the the negative aspects of the exclusion that take place, uh, I think, play out differently, uh, in in different settings. So, so, what? But I am not questioning at all your category of analysis because I think that is the best thing we have so far. Uh, what I'm saying is throwing a bit of a uh, gray into it. That how do we go further? How can we take this? To the next step or next further steps in understanding how that exclusion takes place. So economically, yes, to some extent, it's about agency right away. But you know, we come from cultures where you say, "Oh, my friend owns this, my uncle owns this, and do I have a direct benefit from this, or am I just happy that they own it?" Uh, and how that plays out in then building the further social mobilization or demobilization as a as an effect of that are the kind of so there is a, it's a separate thing that to be studied. It's just the fact that the problem with certification and how it, you know, um, overlaps with ex different expectations is where I'm coming from. But anyway, let's go to to the next question. <laughs> uh, yeah, there's a discussion in the chat, but um, I let people follow that while Diana asks her question. Diana. Yeah. Thank you so much. Yeah, um, my question was also about the categories of. Um, of, of taking it and, and yes, I do have the, the we, we can talk about shaky uh, understanding of class, but I do think it's uh, the, what you describe is that claims are rooted in interests. And that's what's interesting for me is that people then are gathered by the interested groups and these groups are then differentiated in what people seek to get. So the claims are quite interest-based. But then one of the things you said, and it was quite interesting, you said that um, um, there is a gendered nature of these movements in different countries. And then what I, just to expand a bit on that is to uh, what can explain the gender aspect and obviously women are uh, at the forefront of some of these um, most uh, vocal perspectives yeah. and you wrote a fantastic paper about that on Abon in, uh, in Kyrgyzstan. But what's also very interesting to me is of course there are different instances but one of the instances you showed about the microfinance and you spoke about it last week as well is that it feels like in Kyrgyzstan in this particular case they, they're calling for some sort of justice against the neoliberal system and, and pervasive banking that is against their um, economic freedoms and, and, and interests of, and what they're pursuing. And then on the other hand, we see women gathering in front of um, presidential powers in, in Astana or Nur Sultan, and they're claiming, their claims are quite different based on their gender. They're saying we are uh, mothers with multiple children, the state should provide for us. So I think that the, the claims are quite distinct in that uh, perspective, although uh, an external, um, external perspective can say, but these are gendered movements. These are mo women um, who t tend to claim the same thing. So for me, I think the question is really what can explain the gendered nature of these movements and how come uh, they're quite differentiated in both states. And thank you for the fantastic um, presentation today. Thank you. <laughs> thank you, Jan. Um, well, uh, this, the gendered nature of uh, movements uh, would, Start off with uh, you know obvious claim that you know the majority of um, the indebted are women. So we 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 
need to take into account that uh, the relationship uh, between, uh, you know, the, the uh, well, international capital and, uh, and uh, the women is gendered. So, you know, we, we can clearly see that uh, the kind of rent extraction that takes place in the region, uh, it's on, off the backs of the rural women or, you know, uh, urban women. Oh. So that's, that's, that's the crucial uh, part of it. Um, in terms of, um, you know, and, and hence, you know, that explains why then they, you know, kind of emerge as the leaders of, of these movements, because, um, you know, this, for the simple reason is that they are suffering from it uh, the most, right? Um, the, once, once these women uh, uh, sort of enter the political space, right, uh, with their demands, uh, they um, end up facing um, dilemmas. Uh, because on the one hand, uh, you know, um, they're, they're not really, you know, uh, the, the, the political space is, you know, this is a uh, patriarchal setting, uh, and, and they're not really welcome uh, in that uh, uh, political space. So women need to think about, uh, you know, how to package their um, demands. And uh, the women in Kyrgyzstan as well, uh, at, at the very early stage, they uh, framed uh, indebtedness in terms of, um, in terms of uh, you know, issues around uh, motherhood and children. Um, so this was a way of uh, sort of appealing to these uh, patriarchal traditional norms uh, because they were effective, because you had the kind of relationship with the state uh, in both countries, uh, which, which uh, you know, uh, um, it, well, encouraged women to, to, you know, have a lot of children. And, uh, you know, you kind of had the pa patriarchal bargain with the state, right? The state was supposed to provide uh, for these women and, uh, you know, uh, um, and, and, and sort of, you know, uh, take care of the children. Um, so, so when, when uh, you know, women then, you know, uh, try to politicize uh, their demands around debt, it was just a far more, uh, I suppose, effective and efficient way to draw upon those, um, you know, um, discourses uh, that were already there and then frame, uh, let's say, repossession of housing, not as, you know, uh, here I am as a client, uh, as a private individual who is unable to, you know, default it and unable to make payments, but to say I'm a mother and uh, I've got children and, uh, and the bank is, uh, is making my family homeless. So then you appeal to the state uh, and, and, and say, you know, it's your duty now to uh, protect mothers with children. Uh, we're going to end up on the streets. Uh, you, it's, it's a duty uh, to, to um, uh, sort of, you know, um, intervene on our behalf and negotiate with the banks. Um, and uh, and uh, also the other uh, sort of aspect of this is that um, uh, I suppose the, why the reason uh, women uh, ended up leading uh, a lot of these movements, it's because you know the state is a little less repressive, uh, you know, uh, with 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 women. When men uh, you know emerge as leaders, they are very quickly either jailed or murdered. Uh, so it's it's uh, a little safer. Uh, that when women uh, sort of, you know, uh, articulate these demands uh, and, and they're, you know, um, so, so the repressiveness and coerciveness is, 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 is kind of, you know, part of the other factor that influences uh, the gender nature of this uh, social movements. Um, and, and, and the reason in uh, uh, with Kyrgyzstan, I suppose they moved a little bit beyond these um, motherhood claims um, it's, uh, it's, it's linked to, um, um, you know, their uh, assessing of their situation and, and their understanding that, you know, the state at some point was just, uh, you know, uh, death to, 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 to those sort of, you know, motherhood, uh, you know, uh, linked uh, sort of, you know, uh, justifications. And, and they realized that they need to go beyond this and talk about, uh, you know, more about, you know, well, who's benefiting from all this, you know, sort of build upon the discourse of have and have nots. 
And in Kyrgyzstan, particularly in Kyrgyzstani political setting, you, you, this is now very um, uh, sort of, you know, um, uh, it's 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 it's, it's um, the most active discourse actually you know it's it's all linked around sort of you know um, who who is getting all the benefits and 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 you know who's being left out so then you know they started building on that discourse okay so actually we've finished with our time maybe we've even gone five minutes over um, okay sorry no but um, uh, if you allow us uh, and one of our MPhil students wants it, wanted to ask a question if you have two more minutes to spare and you're not sure too tired <laughs> uh, yes, Carlo would you like to ask your question yeah sure what, what about Felix he had a question he, too. <laughs> he's, uh, he did have a question I just asked him if he still wanted to ask but he didn't respond to me so I'm not sure what's going on <laughs> So yeah, had, sorry. Uh, I, okay. Mine was kind of answered already, okay. so just okay. backed out. <laughs> Thank you. Thanks, Felix. Uh, Carlo, if you go ahead and then we let uh, Elvira okay. have her lunch, I think she's been... <laughs> we've, yeah. 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 Anyway, Carlo, so, go ahead. Ciao, Rahmat, for uh, your presentation. First of all, it was uh, very interesting for me, especially because you compared in a way that I never thought about Kyrgyzstan and Kazakhstan. Uh, so yeah, uh, my question is uh, very brief. I just wonder, you know, speaking about the informal settlements in Kyrgyzstan, uh, I was wondering, can it be the case that ethnicity played a role in directing the eviction process uh, in the country? And uh, you know, like I'm, I'm, when I ask about this question, I think about Osh, for instance, where you have like uh, Uzbek Mahallas from one side and Kyrgyz rayons from the others. So yeah, that would be my question. Okay, so whether ethnicity was something yeah, that uh, allowed uh, yeah. sort of, um, it's, it, it played a part, yes. Um, you would, um, it's again, because uh, just like women, they, they um, draw upon uh, uh, sort of uh, nationalist discourses and uh, they do uh, sort of um, articulate uh, their, their um, demands along the lines of, you know, we, here are we the Kyrgyz and, uh, you know, we live in the, our own country um, and uh, we are not, uh, you know, benefiting uh, from uh, whatever, you know, this kind of developments. And, uh, uh, a lot of claims to the land were actually made on the basis of uh, cultural uh, frames. So, you know, um, that uh, in, in Kazakh and Kyrgyz discourses, they would actually go against uh, private property rights uh, by saying that Kyrgyz traditions and Kazakh traditions do not see land as a private property. Uh, and, uh, you know, and, and Kyrgyz and Kazakhs used to just uh, you know, the, we were nomads. Uh, we used to just roam around the land and, uh, um, you know, see a nice spot and, and just claim it. Uh, and uh, and so so uh, the Kyrgyzness and the Kazakhness and the, the past traditions and how what land meant uh, was was part of the um, uh, justification for their actions. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So it wasn't more so much like you know, hey, we're Kyrgyz and you know, give us this, you know we deserve this more than Russians or the Uzbeks, it was more linked to traditional, um, uh, you know, Kyrgyz and Kazakh understanding of what land means. And, and in Kyrgyz, in, in, in traditional cultural understandings, it's not a commodity. This, this was my main point, Elmira, when I was rambling on, that's what I was trying to say. <laughs> <laughs> okay. <laughs> Thank you so much, Elmira. I'll, I'll just add that uh, the nomadic understanding of land and claiming of land is very, very uh, interesting and it's very sophisticated. So I, I would not say that we just roamed around the land. We, they, they knew exactly what they were doing and they, yeah. but, but yes. I'm just uh, using the language which, you know, I, this, is, this was in one of the quotations. Sure. And this is how, you know, one of my informants put it. And I kind of remembered it. Right. So that kind of, you know, what popped up in my head. I mean, it's, it's absolutely, I think, one of the most important things as far as I can take away because I do work on this, but that is very important and how that plays out in, you know, the whole story in Kyrgyzstan and Kazakhstan because a lot of people don't, don't talk about that. And I think it's essential, but, but thank you so much for a absolutely fantastic talk. As you can see, people have been uh, asking questions, commenting, doing all sorts of things in the chat. Uh, if anybody wants to be uh, uh, put in touch with Elmira, let me know. I can ask her and then 
uh, put you in touch. But we'd really like to thank you again for taking time out and uh, spending so much time with us. And um, yeah, thank you, everybody. Well, I think well, thank you. Thank you for listening. Thank you for all the wonderful questions. And, you know, uh, I, I hope I uh, managed to answer, answer uh, well, most of them. Uh, I kind of had to think on my sort of feet. But if I didn't answer some of the questions, um, you know, I hope that you find the in uh, our that's, oh. that's, that's Balihar coming too close to you. That's what's happening. <laughs> that's probably, yes. Yeah. That's coming out this summer. So you know, um, if, if there's something that I didn't address well or left out, uh, you know, bear in mind there will be a publication that explains all of this in far greater detail uh, and than I did today. I had to leave out a lot of stuff, unfortunately. No, thank you. I think it was quite detailed and I think you answered all the questions. So now everybody, uh, you definitely deserve a proper lunch. I wish we could have taken you out uh, for a proper uh, lunch that we always do for our seminar speakers, but, but next time. So thank you again. Thank you very much and hope thank to see everybody. you soon face to face. Absolutely, in, in person. Thank you. Thank you. Bye, Bye, Bye. Thank you, everyone. Bye. 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 Thank you very much, Elmira. Bye. Yeah. Bye, thank you so much. Thank you, thank you guys.